Good morning. Lisa, I just getting started here. Good morning. We're going to get started. Uh, this morning we have Dr. <laughs> Sheila Koper from the Mayo Clinic speaking to us about uh, cleft lip and palate repair, some of the really interesting work she's been doing on this. I know Dr. Koper for about five years now. I met her when we did work together in Quito, Ecuador, and I've enjoyed every minute of my time uh, as her friend and colleague, and I'm really excited about what she has to, what she has to say today. She is uh, Assistant Professor of Otolaryngology and the Chief of Pedi Pediatric Otolaryngology at the Mayo Clinic, um, and uh, I think you're really going to enjoy her talk. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Josh, for that introduction, and thank you all for inviting me to speak. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm going to talk about cleft lip and palate, and uh, it's, a, it's a topic, it's a big part of my practice. It, it has evolved, and it's something I'm very passionate about. Um, I was just in the beginning of the week uh, in Atlanta, the American Cleft Palate Association conference was going on, and a hot topic there is talking about quality and access for this particular population, and we're going to hear a lot more about that um, with the cleft Q projects and things like that that are coming down the pike. But um, I do have two disclosures. One, I was a principal investigator in a research project with the company Preceptus on a tympanostomy tube insertion device, and I'll talk a little bit about that today as well. I also will discuss the off-label use of a tissue filler called Deflux. Um, all right, finally, as much as possible, I've used, I have a lot of pictures of patients in here, and, and these are all, I've tried to include only patients that I've cared for personally and who have given me permission to share their photos. The learning objectives, we're going to um, quickly go over some of the basics, um, differences between different types of clefts, and also the timeline for their repair, some of the things, um, and then the current, what's considered current state. Uh, for reconstruction, and then I'm going to introduce a couple of ideas that hopefully, um, even if this is not a part of your practice, you can take away these concepts and maybe incorporate some of them into your practice. So when we um, look at a child with a cleft, what uh, that child needs really changes throughout their life, and so um, the goal of the reconstruction or the rehabilitation, if you will, is to hopefully help that child grow into an adult who is self-confident, fully actualized, and has excellent communication skills to um, go out and, and create a life that is wholehearted and meaningful apart from their cleft. And the child will always um, be a child with a cleft, but when uh, we first meet the child, we have to take care of some very fundamental things such as feeding issues, breathing issues, make sure those things are going on. And then as we, as the child ages and we go through life, we do need to create the anatomic framework so that there's a separation of the oral cavity and the nasal cavity. We need to rehabilitate speech with therapy and sometimes surgery as well, and hearing. And this is all for the ultimate goal of um, preserving dentition, allowing communication, and um, for the child to, to have excellent function. But also, ultimately, we want to have that, that person feel that they have psychosocial harmony. It, it's, it's a lot of different things that are put together um, throughout the lifetime and care of these patients. So where does it really start? It starts um, in my practice when we get a referral from our maternal fetal medicine colleagues where usually it's an identified cleft lip. You can sometimes detect a cleft palate on prenatal ultrasound imaging, but it's not really very well seen. It's usually inferred when there is also an associated micronathia and the tongue is, is set back and you can sort of guess that there might be a cleft. But the prenatal counseling visit is really an opportunity for education. It's an opportunity to be positive, to um, reassure the family, to answer their questions, for them to meet the team. And I would say about half the families want to see before and after photos and half do not. There is some evidence out there that, that um, prenatal consultation is beneficial, uh, that it 
helps them to adapt, and that it leads to better outcomes. One thing we do agree on is that a multidisciplinary care approach is the gold standard for this population. Um, so when we uh, look at this, I've listed the surgeons first, but we are not the first people that this child needs to see. We do need to assess them at birth, but they need the specialty care of our nurses, our highly skilled nurses, our swallowing therapists, and uh, first. And once that's you know feed, good, excellent feeding and growth is established, then we come in and and look at things. And if you really want to sequence this list according to who is the most going to be spending the most amount of time with a patient from birth to adulthood, you're really talking about your orthodontists, your speech pathologists. They probably have the most number of visits uh, with a cleft patient throughout the years. In general, this is the timeline for repair of cleft. Uh, the lips are usually done by about three months of age, depending. Cleft palate, somewhere in the na neighborhood in most centers, 10, 10 to 18 months of age, where we there is some good evidence that speech outcomes will be similar. And the timing depends on other comorbidities and um, the, the things going on with the patient that you may need to wait a little bit longer. In the three to six year age range, when the patient's able to give us a speech sample, then we assess their speech. We for sure we'll enroll all of these patients with speech therapy if we can, and then maybe offer speech surgery once we do a, an assessment. They move on to orthodontics in preparation for the bone grafting, and then in the later adolescent years, orthonathics if needed, and rhinoplasty. Um, <clears throat> the uh, incidence, how big of a, a population are we talking about here? Overall, I think you can quote one in a thousand, but it really depends on the area of the world you're looking at and our uh, Native American, North and South American populations can be as high as one in 350. You know, we go to Central and South America quite often and there's lots of patients to care for there. And then in the African continent, a little less common, one in 3,000 as far as um, the rates there. The incidence also varies according to gender. It's more common in males than females for cleft lip and palate. Females only, or if it's a cleft palate only, it's more common for females. It, it does vary according to the type, lip and palate being more common than palate only and more common than lip only, and also according to side. So unilateral is more common than bilateral by about three to one, and left-sided, interestingly, is more common than right-sided um, by about two to one. The short answer for what is the etiology of, of clefting is that it's multifactorial. So we know that if you have the right genetic deck of cards interacting with the correct environment, which may or may not have um, and at these other types of um, exposures that could increase your risk, and then an overlay of epigenetics leads to the phenotype of the cleft. The recurrence risk that we quote for parents with one child with a cleft is about 4%, um, really just your typical um, birth defect rate. If a parent is affected, then the chance of a child with a cleft is about 10 to 15%. We also know that many different syndromes are associated with clefts. So there are greater than 300 syndromes that are associated with this. Any residents in the room, feel free. Can they identify this uh, child's gen genetic difference? Shout it out if you can name this, what this child has. I'll give you a hint. She has some velopharyngeal dysfunction. She had a cardiac problem at birth. She had a little bit of an asymmetric crying facies. So. She has velocardiofacial syndrome. This is a condition, 22Q11.2. It's a spectrum of disorder. In the very severe cases associated with hypoparathyroidism and thymic um, disorders. <clears throat> the interesting thing to note, though, is Kathy C. and her group in Seattle looked at their um, population that they saw in their velopharyngeal dysfunction clinic and found that 20% of persistent VPI after adenoidectomy was due to undiagnosed VCFS. So it's something we need to be aware of. Here's another 
father, daughter, they look very similar. They have some facial differences there. Anybody know this one? It's Treacher Collins. So it's an autosomal dominant cleft palate in about a third of these kids. Here's another one. It's um, maybe a little bit trickier to get. Uh, Pierre Robin sequence, cleft palate. Obviously, there's some hearing issues. Another clue is she wears glasses. And this is Stickler syndrome. So these patients can, can have retinal detachments, high myopia. It's the reason that we usually recommend all patients with a cleft palate will ha to have an eye exam within the first year of life. And this was described first by one of our Mayo Clinic pediatricians, Dr. Stickler. I guess there were a lot of patients in Minnesota who had this. Um, and then here's another one, Vander Woods with the lip pits and lower lip pits and clefting, and then trisomies also, obviously. Quick word about Pierre Robin sequence. This is why the airway evaluation is very important. Um, they, it does go along with syndromes. This is the one case where sometimes this can be predicted to have a cleft palate on prenatal ultrasound imaging. It's felt to be due to kind of a mechanical interruption with the tongue being set back, preventing the palate shells from uh, fusing. And you can't always judge the severity of this um, just by looking. Now, in this case, I think you can, but we see a lot of patients who have this who, you know, I just want to caution that it's not one snapshot in time. You have to sort of follow these patients over the first few weeks of their life to make a determination if they need any intervention as far as their airway goes, because they're going to, if it's isolated, Pierre Robin, they're going to have a lot of catch-up man mandibular growth in the first year of life. This is a little girl. You can see she's quite micronathic. Her tongue is set back. And by a year of life, she's really caught up quite a bit. She was able to make it and did not require intervention. And also, this wide, classic wide U-shaped cleft, if you look at the change in that over time, much more favorable now for repair. Her biggest problem now was that she was a Packers fan. <laughs> and here's another child, just a, another, you know, just by looking, doesn't look too bad, but a really big, wide cleft, um, but did okay. And look how better, much better that cleft looks. So we have to, you know, there's a lot of different ways to treat this micronathia, but we have to be cautious because some of them do quite well. Um, the definition of the primary palate and lip is the premaxilla, the anterior septum, and the lip. And it's really by even the sixth week of life where you have failure of the medial nasal process and the lateral nasal process and the maxillary process. So this is by the sixth week of life is when, when this event is, has already taken place. For the secondary palate, which is posterior from the incisive foramen to the uvula, that the, those palatal shells fail to fuse by the end of the first trimester. So it's a little bit later event. The um, very basic um, uh, problem that we're, we need to know about is that there is discontinuity of the orbicularis muscle. And this is important because this is what we need to repair and fix for function. And in the bilaterals, the central portion really rarely has any muscle in it. So you have to be aware of that and understand that anatomy because um, you need to make sure that you reconstitute this orbicularis all the way across that premaxilla. And there's always a nasal component to the abnormality here. I'm going to discuss that a little bit more. The palate, the palate cleft, the muscles, the tensor belly palatini and the levator, Muscles have abnormal attachments along the edge of the cleft, along the free edge of the hard palate, and you have to be aware of this because a good muscular repair in two layers is key. So what degrees of cleft do we see? We see the most minor form of cleft lip is called a microform cleft lip, and often functionally uh, not a significant um, problem. And a lot of parents elect not to have this repaired. Sometimes it doesn't even get picked up right away. Does anybody know a famous actor who has a microform cleft lip? Joaquin Phoenix. Wow. You guys are and the most minor form of a 
cleft palate that we have, see is a submucous cleft palate. It's the triad of the bifid uvula, the zona pellucida. And if you actually palpate the junction of the hard soft palate, you'll feel that notch. And this is what we're, when you, when you are teaching a resident or a trainee to do a, an adenoidectomy, you always counsel them, please, you know, palpate the palate. This is what you're feeling for is that notch. Um, only about half of the patients with a submucous cleft go on to need repair, so we will often delay um, repair of this until we are certain that the patient requires, because 50-50 odds are pretty good. There's just a range of clefts. You can see a little incomplete cleft with a generous Simon Arts band, complete all the way through the lip, um, nasal floor, alveolus, and these wide bilaterals. Um, this is an interesting patient that I took care of with an incomplete bilateral lip who had a bit of a skip lesion, so alveolus intact, but then the secondary palate in the back, and then the midline clefts too. So now we're ready to, we've determined that uh, our patient might benefit from some pre-surgical infant orthopedics. The goal of this is to reduce the severity of the deformity to aid in the surgical repair. and and to create some symmetry of the skeletal base. This concept was brought forward by McNeil in the 1950s and then uh, expanded and elaborated on by Latham with the Latham appliance. Um, more recently, a concept of tissue expansion and tissue shaping has been added uh, based on the, um, the fact that um, ear molding is done. So, in a newborn infant, because there are still circulating maternal hormones, the, the cartilage does not have as much elasticity. And so to take advantage of that, you can actually mold and shape. And this was first described for ears, but later um, expanded upon with nasoalveolar molding. So pre-surgical infant orthopedics can be either passive or active. The active is really the Latham appliance um, and the lip adhesion if, if that's performed, but then plates, taping, NAM is all um, passively done. So it, what I am familiar with using is a tape called Dynacleft tape. It's got a non-elastic and elastic section of the tape and it you apply it to the patient, gently provides that um, gentle tension in order to reposition. This patient had a very protruding and uh, twisted, upwardly rotated premaxilla. We put the tape on, kept it on until repair, and it, it really brought things back quite nicely. I, I really like this picture because this is how this child felt about me about every time I saw him. So NAM is, you know, Dr. Grayson and his group really um, pioneered this, and we have just started to use this at Mayo Clinic, so I'm not, I don't have any picture, I don't have a lot of experience with it. They report excellent um, results, and, and the critical thing is, is this going to, one, hold up over time? Is this going to actually reduce the numbers of secondary revisions? But it's very interesting work. So cleft lip repair, I just, uh, last November, I was in South Carolina for a cleft conference, and after two days of that conference, there's basically repairs that people are doing fall into either a rotation advancement, sort of cut as you go, versus a geometric, precisely measured um, technique, or some <coughs> modification of one of those. My go-to is the Millard rotation advancement. Uh, the non-cleft side is your rotation flap. The advancement flap is on the cleft side, and um, sometimes I'll do a, a little molar modification coming farther up into the columella and maybe add in a, a Z-plasty to better align the, the um, wet and dry vermilion. But whatever you do, um, I think it, we pretty much concluded at the end of that conference too that nobody makes a very large kind of uh, ALAR incision any longer because those they just don't look good. They don't, they're hard to fix. And, and so I would say most centers have dropped that. There are advantages to the Millard. The, the suture line is within the filtral column. It does require experience. So you have to continuously critically 
uh, review your results and, and make modifications um, can tend to make a small nostril. And the, the scar being a straight line scar, you, you can experience a lot of contraction with that. And I'll show you a picture of that in a bit. This is just some results with the Millard repair, a very minimal cleft of the lip only. Um, a little bit wider cleft, um, rotated maxilla, still able to get that closed nicely with the Millard. And this was a little guy who was a twin. Again, this right side, it's a less common. Um, a little bit wider cleft. He was a twin, so he had a comparison right there. So the scar contracture is something that happens, and I always counsel and prepare my parents um, beforehand for this. And you'll be glad that you do because it can look perfect on the table, but a few, few months or weeks later, you start to see that, that riding up, that scar getting short, and, and parents start to get worried and nervous. So just make sure I tell them about it beforehand. It gets short, and then over the course of another two to three years, it will drop down and lengthen. Occasionally, you do a little steroid injection or something to help that along. I'm going to quickly go through triangular flap repair is just another technique. And for bilaterals, the straight line closure is really pretty much the go-to and, and common. This is before any uh, pre-surgical infant orthopedics that I was doing, so this was just a repair done without that. The cleft nasal deformity that we see classically is that columella, which uh, is short in the unilateral and by, we have that tip deflection towards the side of the cleft. The lower lateral cartilage is horizontally oriented and um, flattened, and you can get a very small internal um, nair. And this is also partially because there's a septal deflection towards the side of the cleft. And so the question is, should we really be addressing these um, issues with the nose at the primary repair. And I think a lot of people have written about this, but this was a nice review of a very long experience. Um, Sailor looked at 750 patients, and in fact, when he did the primary rhinoplasty with the repositioning of the nasal cartilages and the, the sutures and the bolsters, um, it did reduce the number of secondary revision surgeries, and that, that's a, a very important thing for patients. There's absolutely no science to what I do after surgery. Uh, I do give antibiotics that let them feed how they, how they will. I used to put in nylon sutures until I realized that I never have a resident in clinic to take them out, so I don't do that any longer. I just use fast-absorbing suture. I put uh, Dermabond on top, and I have them start... Uh, using ointment at five days to dissolve the tissue glue, and that removes the st stitches as well, and it, it really heals quite nicely. So for cleft palate repair, um, the goals are um, to, to repair for speech. I mean, we, we know that ch children can feed and grow with a cleft of the palate. You, you know, we see in other countries older kids who come in never repaired, but it's for speech. And um, also there's some evidence that uh, you can improve eustachian tube dysfunction. Uh, Bluestone and then more recently Castlebrunt showed that um, eustachian tube dysfunction can improve. The surgical goals are really simply stated, close the hole, repair the muscle, and lengthen the palate. Um, you want a very good tension-free multi-layer closure. Um, different ways to, to do this. I'm not going to go into this detail here so that we can get through all of this talk. Um, the, my favorite operation, though, one that I wish I would have thought up, is the furlough double reversing Z-plasty, which is kind of an ingenious operation to deal with the soft palate. It really gets you a good um, double layer of muscle, and it lengthens the palate, and it is um, quite nice. So again, no science to this at all, what I do after cleft palate repair, but I do give them antibiotics for 10 days. Prefer they don't go back to bottle feeding, particularly if it's a complete cleft, and so you have sutures that are just right up to the gum line. Uh, so that we recommend alternate uh, method of feeding, whether it's a free-flowing sippy cup, 
sideways spooning, open cup, syringe. And I always tell this story, you cannot be too specific about what to give a child for a cleft palate diet. I, ha I had, a, when I was in Tennessee working at Vanderbilt, I had a little 18 month old come to her post-op visit and she had a 20 ounce bottle of Coca-Cola that she was carrying. And, and I asked the mom, does she drink that usually? And, Oh yeah, she drinks that all the time. And I look in, of course, you know, it's it's very caustic and it, it had dissolved a couple of stitches. So with ear disease, cleft lip, no increased risk of ear disease than the average bear. Cleft palate, uh, for some, you know, there are 96% of those patients are going to go on to need ear tubes. What's interesting is that 4% of those patients don't need ear tubes. And I always thought that that would be an interesting group to study. Um, but um, they do eventually outgrow. Uh, they're more likely to need a second set of tubes, but they do eventually outgrow the eustachian tube dysfunction, and the palate repair can, can help with that. There's slightly increased risk of uh, complications from ear problems, too. What I do in my practice is at six months of age, uh, we now have a device that's FDA approved to use with moderate sedation to insert ear tubes. So this could be something that anybody who who um, places ear tubes in their practice may want to learn more about and consider. Uh, we looked at, it was a multi-center trial. We looked at just at Mayo Clinic 77. Children were enrolled in this, 15 under general anesthesia where there's a learning curve with the device. We, it, it actually makes an incision in the eardrum and a tube which is preloaded. You can deploy that just by rolling a wheel and place the tube. Um, so there's a little bit of a learning curve with it, but then when we transition to moderate sedation, we were able to uh, have a pretty consistent 10% only conversion rate to general anesthesia. Parents will come in, and I know you've all been in that the same position where they're asking about you know, safety of anesthesia, there's a lot of awareness of neurotoxicity in this day and age, and, I don't, I'm not advocating that what they're given for moderate sedation is any safer, but it is an option, and you do have quicker re recovery times. You also have, um, uh, you have quicker recovery times, and, and sometimes there's less uh, nausea and vomiting afterwards. So the one thing that we did also study uh, was that the device, you can connect a suction to it, but um, I stopped doing that, and lo and behold, patients were not coming back with middle ear effusions or block tubes or things like that, so the, you know, we, we get, train a lot with the thinking that you must suction evacuate the middle ear, but I would suggest that perhaps this is not always necessary, and um, when we do moderate sedation ear tubes, I've stopped doing that. So VPI, just a word about that. No matter um, how good your repair is, the reported rates of VPI after cleft palate repair are around 20 to 30 percent. Um, this is evidenced by hypernasality and nasal regurgitation. Um, palate might be too short, might be immobile. So we see all these kids in our velopharyngeal insufficiency clinic. They have perceptual speech evaluation. We do nasometry. We do speech nasendoscopy um, together with the um, speech pathologist. The, some centers rely a little bit also on a, a video speech fluoroscopy. I don't really use that so much because I find it's not that helpful and it exposes the kids to radiation, and I don't really think that I need it to make my clinical decision. We recommend speech therapy or surgery. The typical surgeries that can be considered for treatment of EPI would be your pharyngeal flap, your sphincter pharyngoplasty, possibly a surgery on the palate. Um, Kathy C. and her group in Seattle have come up with an algorithm where they combine the furlough with the sphincter, for large gaps and maybe just do uh, furlough alone for small and medium sized gaps. But what, what I have started doing, about four years ago, I did a, 
a literature search to look at all tissue fillers and their safety and durability and I was kind of looking for that um, that special substance that I could use to augment in the nasopharynx and what I came upon was um, deflux and the reason that I ended up selecting it is that it, this is a this is a filler. It's a hyaluronic acid that's um, a copolymer with dextranomer, and it had been used for years in Europe to treat children who have urinary reflux. And so there was a long history of safety. And the two studies which um, they used to obtain their FDA approval for that use um, had one to three year follow up. So that was a lot longer than most of the fillers that are out there. So I kind of very gingerly started doing this. I discussed it with all my patients. This is off-label use. And um, gradually developed this technique, which I went back and reviewed my first 50 kids that I have done this with. And it's a straightforward operation. We do it under general anesthesia most of the time, uh, except in adults where we can do it with just moderate sedation. And we just inject submucosally in the nasopharynx about three milliliters of the filler, and it stays in place. It's kind of a precise pocket sort of concept. And of these patients, 92% had no or mild VPI after the injection, um, eradicated their nasal grimace, um, 83%, and 95% we treated their nasal emission. So there are different ways to assess VPI. These were the things that uh, we broke it down to assess. We had all outpatient surgery, so, so there were no unplanned admissions. You didn't have that you know, three to five day stay in the hospital that you can get with a pharyngeal flap. One patient out of the 50 developed sleep apnea, and it was a patient who had had Pierre Robin, and I went back and took out her tonsils, and she was fine. It takes less than 15 minutes to do, so again, this is minimizing those effects of the anesthesia in kids who are going to have many different exposures throughout their life. So this was submitted and accepted for my trilogical thesis and hopefully will be coming out in laryngoscope soon. Um, I'm going to play for you just a video of a patient who had this injection procedure done. And so you'll hear her speech before and then again after and then some time after. So very hypernasal. Very active grimacing. A moderate size gap in the back. And that's our speech pathologist asking the phrases. So her plosives have improved significantly. You can see this is the augmented area, and she is now four years out. She's one of the first that I've done and has a really stable result. So her, her mom is extremely happy with this um, result. So just looking at um, another, one other word about the injection pharyngoplasty. This is something that also can translate to adults. I know there's a lot, a lot of head and neck surgeons here. And if you have a patient who ends up with, say, a, a palatal weakness or a VPI post-surgical or post-treatment for head and neck cancer, I see all the adult patients too and treat them with, with these injections. The difference is we take them to the operating room, we do it with moderate sedation, we, we are able to get real-time feedback from the patient with a speech sample and do the injection with them awake, they go home the same day, and it's, it's 
you're never going to meet a happier patient than than when you can treat their VPI because they're they're very happy that they are alive from whatever the cancer whatever they were treated for, but they do have significant problems with swallowing. They do have significant speech problems. And if you can restore that with something like a simple injection, these patients are extremely happy. Um, another, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the oronasal fistula. This is a very sad thing when a patient comes back in post-op from palate repair, and you start to see wound breakdown. I usually see them about a month out, so you're going to know if there's if there's some wound breakdown there. And um, when we look at rates, uh, success rates of repair of a palate fistula, operative repair, it's less than 50%. And you know, there's blood supply issues, it's fibrosis issues, it's um, tissue that's not pliable, and it's it's very difficult. It's a problem. I did a self audit the first 100 palates that I uh, repaired, um, and you know, I had a 4% fistula rate, which I think is well within the reported range, but it's still for each individual patient, it, it's a real problem. And um, so what to do about it? Well, we had a um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy um, specialist come and give a, a grand rounds for us. And he was talking about uses of, uses of hyperbaric oxygen therapy in the head and neck. And several, several weeks later, I had a patient referred that I saw who, when she was a year of age, had a palate repair. Um, this was done elsewhere. It broke down. Um, the surgeon took her back very early. I, I don't know what they were able to do at that second operation. But she came to me at about 18 months of age, and she had this. So we kind of um, waited, and when she was close to two, I went back and did a you know, nice turn-in flap, two-layer closure, and about a week out, mom calls, and she's, she's just freaking out because she's, she's noticed some stitches have opened. And so the patient comes in with this. I was very discouraged and upset. I went to bed, and... Of course, I had a dream. I think I do my best thinking when I'm asleep. And I woke up and I said, well, we're going to put her in the hyperbaric chamber. So we did. And about four weeks later, this had now become this. And two years out, it's this. Now, it's still there. And I don't have a more recent photo. It is smaller. It's probably down to about two millimeters in size. But since there really is no other treatment in the immediate post-op, time period to treat a fistula, I started to think maybe this could be something that could be beneficial. So another another fistula that I treated and nice two-layer closure came together. About a week out, you start to see there's some fibrinous debris. It's a whole, um, put her in the hyperbaric chamber. They do something like 10 to 20 dives once a day for 90 minutes or twice a day, 45 minutes. and this is what, what she looked like at a month. And then several months later, I was walking through the pre-op area, and mom calls me over, and she's so excited. She, she says, I just, you have to look at this because that hole is almost closed. And so it really did virtually almost close, and it's functionally not a problem at all. So I looked at this and presented this at the European Society of Pediatric Odo in Ireland in 2014. Five patients, four had um, fistula repairs. One was a primary palate that had some wound breakdown. They underwent, all went on um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy starting about a week after surgery. And um, they all improved. And it's just something to think about. It's not, you know, it's not a, a controlled trial, but it's something that may be of benefit in, in for this very difficult problem. So just to review the differences for the residents, lip, no feeding difficulty. Um, those patients can often breastfeed without any problem. They usually don't have eustachian tube problems. If they have a uh, speech disorder, it's, it's typically going to be articulation related if the alveolus is involved. Palate, um, feeding difficulties, yes. Usually we suggest special feeders. Eustachian tube problems, 
yes, high likelihood of needing tubes, and speech, that could be um, both articulation and hypernasality. So take home points, I would say, um, pre-surgical infant orthopedics can help. You are either gonna be doing some variation of straight line or geometric closure, do something, look critically at your results, make changes as you need to. Um, consider doing the initial cleft rhinoplasty. I think it can be a benefit. And we don't make that wide ALAR incision any longer. For pallets, I think most centers would agree that you do the repair between 10 to 18 months of age. For equal speech outcomes, two layer closure is key with a good muscle repair. And if you have any wound breakdown, consider hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Um, and then I would just like to say one last uh, comment about um, some of you may know, some of you may not know that your very own Dr. Rosenberg goes to keto every year and um, selflessly donates his time and expertise to take care of patients there. This is a team in keto that we've applied for uh, to be listed with American Cleft Palate Association. Um, it's been in existence for 17 years. A lot of the patients that, have, that had their initial lip repair 17 years ago are still coming back to this team. We have uh, comprehensive services. We take a speech pathologist every year from our institution, audiologist. We get hearing aids donated. And so we really consider it to be uh, performing the gold standard care for these kids. And um, do we have time for one last video? Yeah, OK. This is. Uh, just a video showing stress VPI patient that I treat. I see a lot of musicians who play wind instruments and they have no problems with speech, but maybe have um, trouble with uh, air escaping when they play their wind, wind instruments. And so this was a patient that I treated. Of all the surgical instruments that come into play in the operating room, the oboe may be the last one you'd expect to see, or hear. But in this case, pediatric otolaryngologist Sheila Cooper thought it might be the most important. <laughs> She's treating patient Mara Reed for BPI. Do a little pharyngeal insufficiency. That's just a fancy word that means um, some air was escaping out the back of her uh, throat and up and out through her nose when she was playing her instrument. Mara's been in the operating room with Dr. Colfer before. Several years ago, chronic sinus and throat infections called for the removal of her tonsils and adenoids, but not before they had a serious conversation. A conversation about the risks for a highly accomplished musician, such as Mara. There is a risk of developing this difficulty with playing your wind instrument or even with speech if you take out the adenoids. I think it looks like the the difficulty looks like this. The little air bubbles you see at the back of Mara's throat are speaking through gaps left when the infected tissue was removed. So I start noticing that my endurance was lower. I couldn't play for as long as I wanted to. And you hear these little audible snorts coming out of my nose, which would sometimes interrupt my playing. Dr. Colbert's solution is an injectable solution, often used as a cosmetic filler. Or to resolve urinary reflux in children, Dr. Culver says it's a safe way to plump up soft tissues. Bringing in the oval, however, was a first. What better way to put the full force of the woodwind's air pressure demands to the test? So that we can pinpoint precisely where we need to uh, put the filler material to augment uh, the nasopharynx. That also meant Mara needed to be awake, only mildly sedated. But they didn't want to give me too much because they wanted me to be able to play over in the operating room because that would be the best, the best chance of success. Success is exactly what they got. Really happy that this all worked out so that I can perform those as well as I can. For the Mayo Clinic News Network, I'm Dennis Dillon. So that's all I have. This is the last time I was in New York City. I was in December. It was actually warmer than, than it is this trip. And um, this is 
my daughter, we had several really lovely walks on the Upper East Side by the river. And I think if you have a sociable four-year-old and or a puppy, you can make friends with just about anybody in New York City. Thank you very much. If anybody, yeah. So I um, I usually just do a furlough if I if it's soft palate only. Um, I know people do hard palate, and um, so I, I'm not doing them together. But I know some people do. Yes. So uh, thank you for a very nice talk and very informative. Uh, I have a question about when you do primary lift and you talk about doing a primary rhinoplasty. How much dissection do you need? Oh, sure. So the question is about the primary rhinoplasty. What do we do, and um, how do, how are we fixing that? And what I typically will do is, you know, dissection um, to reposition the lower lateral cartilage. So I dissect up and over on the skin side and the vestibular side to really mobilize that envelope and then you know, get a good anchoring stitch to bring that nostril over. And you have to pay a lot of attention to, there's a lot of, um, each cleft is unique, but there's a lot of deficit in the anterior posterior dimension as well as um, the width. And so you set in that first um, stitch to, to fix where your nostril is, shape is going to be. And then you can put in, I just usually put transnasal suture. Sometimes I'll um, fix it to the upper lateral cartilage on the contralateral side and the same side. I don't tend to use bolsters. I just use a stitch uh, clear PDS suture and come in and out through the same hole. And that stitch goes away after about six months. And it it seems to really help nicely to, to do this. And I, I don't really stent for a long period of time. Sometimes I'll stent for very short periods of time, either overnight or less than a week. Yes. How much, what percentage of your BPI practice are you, are you using reflux for compared to surgical technique before you start? Mm -hmm. That is excellent question. It really has revolutionized my practice and um, I would have to look, I would say probably I do 50% fewer sphincters and pharyngeal flaps than I was doing. If it is a small or small moderate size gap, um, and we have ways of estimating that when you're doing your speech nasal endoscopy, it's my go-to. I, I do discuss all options with parents because I like to give them that, you know, make sure that they feel they're making an informed decision. Um, but it's my go-to for all small and moderate size gaps. If it's a large gap, if it's, you know, you look in, it's just a big black hole, I, I there's no point because it, it's not going to, you're not going to be able to get enough filler in there to stay. So I'll do a flap in that case. And you always do it through a transnasal approach, not through a transoral approach? So when I do kids under general anesthesia, I do a transoral approach with a dental mirror. I just used to visualizing it that way. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, of the patients who ended up after injection pharyngoplasty with no or mild VPI, um, how many of them had to go on to, to, for a more formal speech surgery? And then is there any difficulty after that? Um, does, it, does it burn a bridge in doing those, or do you encounter any difficulties? I have had to do that. Um, most families, and this is, this is something that I think uh, we need to really look at more, and it would make it would make the paper stronger if we had some patient-reported outcomes, and we, you know, because 
mild VPI to me, I might notice and I might be like, oh, I want to get that. But to a patient, they may not be, it may not be that impactful to them or to their, to their parents. So I will have to look and see exactly the number, but it's not that many that end up going on to need a secondary, a, a more formal speech surgery. I, in the cases that I have done that, um, it's been because uh, the patient had had speech surgery previously, and so there was a lot of scarring, and that potential space in the uh, submucosal potential space in the nasopharynx, I was not able to successfully get the filler to to stay in there, and so I did try, and then I it didn't work, and so I went back and I did a pharyngeal flap, and there's no it wasn't excessive in terms of bleeding. Um, I did encounter the filler and it just suctioned right back out. So it, but it, I have had to do pharyngeal flap or sphincter after an injection and it hasn't been an issue. It's not that often though. Great, well thank you very much, that was terrific. Thank you very much. And there's m and here. Sorry, I was late. Hey, no problem. Hi. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much for inviting me. You got in okay and everything? Yeah, no problem. Josh